Starting the Prison Project 10 years ago, we came to understand that part of the problem with over-incarceration was that there was not enough rehabilitative programs to fit the needs of the prisoners. You know, I've been inside prisons shooting a couple different movies, Shawshank Redemption and Dead Man Walking, and I'd been aware of you know, they got a weight room and they've got cable TV and why are we, why are they living in the lap of luxury? And that's always been for me just such a ridiculous notion because there is no luxury in prison and it's in fact very, very difficult and in fact very difficult to survive in prison and even more difficult when you consider the fact that there's no rehabilitation programs or very little that are helping the inmate change their path. And so for me, our work in prison became connected to a a public safety issue that with the realization, knowing that 95% of the people that we work with in prison are going to get out soon, within 10 years, wouldn't you want these people coming back to your neighborhood with better tools on how to deal with disappointment and negativity and aggression? Wouldn't you want them with better tools to deal with these things than when they went in? It seemed like society had just kind of thrown up its hands and said, you know what, they're just going to come back to prison. And that's incredibly expensive, unnecessary, and as far as you know, the moral issue goes, it's, it's contemptible that we would treat fellow human beings with such disregard and disrespect because they had made a mistake. work with the inmates the same way we work with our actors in our workshops. And so what we came to understand was there's something about the way we work at the actors gang, the combination of a physical discipline and a rigorous demand for emotional honesty. Those two combined somehow was providing a transformative experience for the inmates that were attending the class. One of the first things we tell our actors, and also the inmates when we're training them, is that we, what we're seeking is a intense reality, and for that reason, the number one rule is you cannot touch the other actor in any way. You can't shove, you can't caress, you can't touch in any way. So physical space is very important. We do group work so that these guys have to create and these women have to create together. It doesn't work without all of them doing it. In other words, no leaders and no followers. We tell them at the start what we're building is here is an ensemble, a group of people that work together well. And in order for that to happen, in order for that collectivity to happen, there has to be a certain generosity and a humility. And so this is what we work on getting first. How do we build a team here? Most of them have been on sports teams at some point, and they understand that concept. But it's the concept of how do we truly make ourselves better as a group with all of the individuals in this group rising up, but not relying on one person to lead us there. We will lead ourselves, in other words. This is the first step. Once we get into improvisation and into expressing emotion, we have to understand that they are expressing this emotion as characters from the Commedia dell'arte. The scenarios of the Commedia dell'arte are pretty simple and and the characters are, are stock characters. It's trying to free up the mind to not have to create everything out of whole cloth. It's basically giving them a format. There's a rich old man. There's a young man who's in love with a woman named Isabella. There's uh, the servant named Harlequino. There's a servant named Max. There's a relationship between Harlequino and Colombina, the rich suitor that wants to marry the Isabella and their old rich miser. Panelloni wants that because he wants the money. He doesn't care that she's in love with a young man. And it's in in the simplicity of that that we can find the depth of emotion because they're not trying to create something out of whole cloth. It's really interesting what happens if you put someone that has been through the 
gang life in Los Angeles, and you put him into the character of Pantalone, their old rich miser. It's interesting what comes out of his mouth. There's a buffer. They are playing characters. It is a safe zone for them to be able to kind of rip open layers that might have been suppressing emotions for years. And what happens is they find it, they do it. They find the deep levels of sadness and elation, happiness, and they find fear. They express these things on stage. All three emotions, which by the way, you don't show on the yard. There's one yard emotion and that's anger. I am tougher than you, I will kick your ass. That's what the survival go-to emotion is in prison. And this room allows them to express emotions that they have not expressed for a long time. And so we're in an improvisation and imagine there's a person that comes on the stage and he's angry and another person comes on the stage and they're angry as well. And I say, well, there's really no scene here except for an argument and a fight. Why don't we try a different emotion in response to anger? This would be in the second or third week. And by the eighth week, they've already been presented with several different improvisational situations where they've been confronted with anger and had to respond with three different emotions, happiness, sadness, or fear, but not anger. And lo and behold, guess what happens? They understand they have a choice in the emotions that they express. They have a choice. Anger is a choice. If someone comes up to you angry, it is your choice to engage or not engage. And so what it does surreptitiously is gives these men and women a different path, a different way to process disappointment, hostility, anger. And I've heard again and again from these guys, I was in a situation, there was a guy up in my face, I would have fought him before this class. When I was looking at him, he looked ridiculous. He looked like a character from the Commedia dell'arte, and I started to laugh. It put it into perspective for them, you know? It, it gives them the tools to avoid confrontation. For whatever reason, we discovered that there were some constants in the reactions of the w men and women that took the course, and, and those constants were Ability, sometimes for the first time in their lives, to talk to family in an intimate way and personal way, a better relationships with their children on visits, being able to be open emotionally with them, understanding their own vulnerabilities, creating bonds with the people in that room, bonds that they say far deeper than bonds they had in their gangs and some in their families going across interracial lines, blacks with whites, Latinos with whites, all of a sudden this segregated culture that is on the yard is now being broken up because of this class, because there's people now crossing over, because they've created such bonds in that class and such friendships in that class that they continue those friendships openly in front of other inmates on the yard. And once one person does that, it allows uh, many other people to do it that have that same feeling inside them but won't cross over the racial lines because of fear. We're starting to get some very encouraging numbers as far as recidivism and uh, in reduction in violent offenses within prison. We've had wardens tell us that it's changed the culture of prison. So what we've came to understand is that what we're doing is incredibly effective, it's working, and it's making things safer. And at, at that point, when we understood that, we realized we had to expand, and it, was, it had to become our mission to try to uh, bring this to every prison in the state of California. We had this guy that came up to me about seven weeks into the course. He said to me that, you know, there's this prison guard that is really mean to us, and uh, he says abusive things, and he, he's putting us back in the dorm early. He's taking us out late, spot inspections, 
putting us on lockdown for no reason. That's this kind of like this kind of guy. And he said, you know, I looked at him the other day and I started wondering what's going on with him at home. What is his life like that it manifests in hostility towards us? And I was listening to this guy and I'm realizing, oh my God, this man has empathy for his oppressor. That was actually the moment that I realized, oh my God, we got to expand this thing. Because this is next level stuff. This is where you take the lessons of the class and then you say, well, okay, let's just forget about me for a second. Who are these sentient beings that I'm living amongst? And who are they as souls? And who are they as people? Who are they? You know, the, the idea that you can start seeing to a deeper level of empathy is pretty extraordinary. The goal is to bring the discipline and the method to the inmates and the inmates themselves conduct the program. We had one group in particular where we did three sessions with them and, uh, over the course of a couple of years, and then we said we couldn't come back because we were going to a different part of the prison. We'll be back in eight months. And then three months later, we get a phone call from the prison saying we've been invited to see a play that they've written and directed, and we find out that two of the guys that we had trained had started their own theater company and had trained 40 new people in the method that we were working in. So we came to understand that that was the way we could expand the program. We just took the clue from the prisoners. Mm -hmm.